Machine learning is a very interesting topic and at the 33rd Astronomical Data Analysis Software and Systems Conference at the University of Arizona in Tucson, I had the pleasure to talk with an astronomer that also happens to be an expert in the field. Here having an interview with Dr. Kai Polsterer and uh, he uh, is going to talk to us about the wonderful work that he has done over the years. I have had the pleasure to meet, to know him for many years, and I always fascinated with what his, he does. But if you please let us know where you work now. Yeah, hello everybody. So my name is Kai Polstra. I'm from the Heidelberg Institute for Theoretical Studies, and my research group is on astroinformatics. It's at the intersection between computer science and astrophysics. And that's how we always meet over the years at ADAS, at ADAS yeah. conferences, because without software, without data access, there wouldn't be data intense science. So that's why I'm here, that's why we are talking. Yes. Thanks for having me. No, that's, that's wonderful to have you. And actually, I was learning that you got first, uh, you studied computer science, right? That's right, that's right. I first studied computer science and did a minor in medicine, actually. Oh my because God. Because I was always interested in different things. But I was always a hobby astronomer. So that's why I studied physics and did my PhD in astronomy and physics. So I always say I'm computer scientist by head, but astronomer by heart. Yeah, but also that I think that helps you to, uh, at the beginning you started with astronomy when um, you graduated, but then you move to do machine learning, right? And I think probably your background in computer science help you to immerse yourself easier in that field. Yeah, I think it was already my third lecture I had, must be more than 20 years ago in computer science, was on AI systems actually back then. And I still remember when I did my PhD thesis, machine learning was a topic where a lot of supervisors would have said, now here we do a physics PhD, yeah. machine learning AI, it's not the future, don't do this. And now you are doing it for 20 years, you're sort of overrun because everyone does machine learning in astronomy. Yeah, yeah. now, so I have seen your uh, publications that you introduce a lot of machine learning. So, and it's most, most of the things that you do also, you introduce that concept. Why do you think it is important in astronomy to use machine learning and the different, actually the different fields that you have been uh, using it? It is not just one single topic in science. You have used it for different things. Yes, exactly, and I think the beautiful thing we have in astronomy is we have mind-boggling problems. Time series, for example, in astronomy is completely different to time series on the stock market. We have gaps in between. We have different kind of noise. You don't have noise on the stock market data. So the problems we have are really challenging and interesting. And on the other hand, it's so cool to have this rich and very interesting data available and we share it, so it's publicly available. If you work on medicine problems, for example, it's always an issue protecting the personal rights of the individual humans that are involved in the experiments. A AGN does not care, a supermassive black hole in a <laughs> galaxy does not care if the data is not treated respectfully. Mm -hmm. So we have free data, we have challenging problems, and I would say we have the coolest questions in the universe because we want to understand where the universe comes from, how it evolves. We want to understand is there life outside? And those are the really huge challenges I by heart think are what makes physics and astronomy so interesting. Mm -hmm. So free data, very complex problems, and it's a perfect playground to do machine learning in astrophysics actually. That's, that's a very interesting thing, but also I, I believe that you have used that for planning observations uh, to schedule observations. At a one point, I believe you gave a um, tutorial in that area. Yeah, I, I gave several tutorials at ADAS on how to use machine learning in astronomy. I gave an introduction on how to use neural networks. 
in astronomy and to explain really what neural networks are about, you still can find it at tinyurl.com slash intro number character 2 ann. Okay, that's great So you great can find it and look it up. It's still online. It's a collab, easy to play with. Yeah, so back then when I did my PhD thesis in physics and astronomy, I was working on Lucy. It's a near-infrared image and spectrograph here at Mount Graham, here in, in Arizona. Arizona. And I've been there. And of course, if you now build such an instrument in the near-infrared, you can use it to look for very distant AGNs. So I used machine learning back then to identify candidates based on photometry that are very likely highly redshifted AGNs for follow-up observations with the large telescope you have. Uh -huh. Because the supermassive large holes, I think, are always meant like you drill a hole in the sky at a certain tiny spot, you get a very rich and intense data set, but you need the survey astronomy to allow you to figure out where to drill the hole. And that's what I use machine learning for. So in that sense, it's observation planning. You use machine learning to figure out how things work. I also used machine learning to control. Lucy is a cryogenic instrument, mm -hmm. so it's really cool inside to be able to observe in the near infrared. So we have a robot arm that takes slit masks for multi-object spectroscopy in the cryogenic instrument into the focal plane. And because of the limited space inside, under different kinds of rotation, gravity worked on the robot arm differently. And so I used machine learning optimization algorithms so the system would, while operating, automatically adapt the robot arm and automatically compensate. If things got stuck, it recovered automatically using you very see. simple optimization. <laughs> yes. So, yes, yeah, I'm, but I'm using it. In many things. In many things, in astronomy and also in different fields. Very yeah. powerful, which I think that it is, is wonderful. So if you, is, you talk about the, the slit in a spectroscopy, can you explain to people that don't understand much what that means on a slit, just briefly? Yeah, so the idea is if you want to get more detailed information of the universe, you want to do spectroscopy. So you take the light of a source, disperse it, like you know it from a prism or a glass of water. So you see the nice rainbow and there are some really cool covers actually in music from cool bands we remember with the prism on top. Yeah. Yeah, so many bands actually did. <laughs> and you disperse the light and that allows you to get very detailed, distinct information at different wavelengths and that tell you about certain ongoing physical processes. You need that. So this is dispersion of light. Mm -hmm. But now if you want to disperse light, you have the problem that the spatial axis with the wavelength axis start to overlay. By putting a slit in front of sources, you can sort of limit the information you want to have. So you confine the aerial information to the width of the slit. And you use a dispersion of it along the other axis uh -huh. to learn about the wavelength. So the idea in Lucy was not to have a single long slit, there are also long slits uh -huh, yes. in it with different width. So it gives you a different resolution for all of those interested in that. There's really cool YouTube videos online to learn uh, yeah. about those things. That's so, but Lucy had multi-object spectroscopy. So you take an image of the sky beforehand. Then you figure out, I want a spectra of this, 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 this. You l use a high precision laser cutting yeah. machine to cut slits into alloy masks. And you use those alloy masks in the focal plane of the instrument to really select distinct sources. And that makes it so powerful because taking images takes minutes or hours. Taking spectra takes far longer because yeah. by dispersing the light, you lose the amount of photons you collect for a certain wavelengths. To get to a certain signal to noise ratio, you have to integrate longer over time. That makes it complicated. Now with multi-object spectroscopy, you take a lot of spectra oh, yeah. in parallel and make better utilization of the very oh. expensive telescope time. That's that's wonderful. Thanks so much for the explanation. It was a little bit longer. Sorry for that. <laughs> no. But if you ask me to no, explain it, I'll explain that's it. That's fine. No, no, no. That's fine. Uh, what is the kind of research that you are doing now uh, in this moment? Um, that the poster that you brought here to this conference. Uh, what are you? What are you doing now? That is so interesting. Yeah. My, my group, my the astroinformatics group at HITS, we focus on two aspects. 
One aspect is machine learning to really answer some of the bigger questions in astrophysics. That's one of the big things. And the other big thing is infrastructure. How to make data available to the researchers all over the world. And the tricky thing is data got so rich, so large, so complex, and I'm not using the term big data because this is just <laughs> merchandising stuff. <laughs> yeah. But without the right techniques, finding the information, finding the elements, the data you're interested in, is tremendously complex. I now got involved in a project for simulations because we often just think of observatories producing data, yeah. but also simulations are a very rich source of data. And it's different data, it's more complete, it's covering full physical spaces, it's not something we observe with noise, it's something we simulate based on very fundamental physical laws. And simulation data is rich and large, and now the question is, how do we deal with this even more increasing amount of data when we come to exascale computing, even larger simulations? So we are now involved in space, it's an EU project, a lighthouse project for exascale computing, and it aims on preparing the mostly used codes in astrophysics for simulation for the age of exascale computing. On one hand side, that means making the codes scale better for the simulations. On the other hand, it also means how do we deal with the upcoming avalanche of data in simulations. And that's what I'm focusing on. It's an infrastructural question. How can we provide explorative access to data generated in simulations? And on the poster, I'm now presenting an idea where we sort of cleverly misuse or use in an alternative way standards and tools developed within the framework of the International Virtual Observatory Alliance. And we tread out to use those tools that are already available, where astronomers are familiar with, to utilize them to present data from simulations. On the poster, we took data from cosmological simulations, illustrious in this mm -hmm. example, and we took images, or we generated images of galaxies out of that, and used dimensionality reduction methods to make the galaxies browsable by structure, by morphological features. If you think of the Hubble tuning fork telling you you have uh -huh, certain yes. kind of spiral galaxies or elliptical galaxies stretching out, we now did the same, but we used spherical coordinates. Spherical coordinates we would use on the sky to determine what is the position of a source. We now m use or utilize in a way of saying at that position are the spiral ones, at that position are the elliptical ones. Here you find the dwarfish ones. And thereby you easily can strive for catalogs of millions of galaxies and identify the galaxies you're interested in. And the concept we are presenting is not limited to galaxies only. We can use spectra, we can use any kind of data, time series data, anything you are interested in, structure it by similarity in morphology, depending on your similarity function you use mm -hmm. for the machine yeah. learning, for the unsupervised dimensionality reduction or self-supervised dimensionality reduction approach, and then projecting it in a sphere or on a sphere mm -hmm. to make it browsable. That's what we are presenting here. And I think it's a still not perfectly running thing. It's a pro early, very early prototype. We had the idea to start it last summer so five months ago, <laughs> and we are now presenting the prototype because we want to, that's what a conference is good for. Not only get have input. have video presentations, but have coffee breaks, have discussions, <laughs> yes. and get inputs, really yeah. understand what we might be lacking in our mm -hmm. requirements, and that's Definitely. why we are here. And are you going to be using those simulations, I mean, the, the objective, if, if I understand correctly, eventually you are going to use that to, um, for real observations to uh, be able to identify the in real observations when you get all that amount of data? In principle, the technique, and that's a cool thing about it, we train a model to learn about structural similarities, morphologies, those things. If we now project down data from simulations and train it on simulations, and we take actual observations, we can plug in an observation and say, 
give me those five simulated galaxies that look closest to mine. Or turn it around and say, look, I have this simulated galaxies. Do you know of any observed galaxies? Let's say in SDSS, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, are there any observed galaxies that looks like the mine I have? And by having the possibility to compare the real observed world and the virtual simulated world, we can figure out where we might have shortcomings in our understanding of how to model the universe. We can enrich our knowledge about the physics ongoing. And that's a cool concept behind it. Y you structure things by morphology, how they look like. And by doing so, you can learn things. We also are playing now. I have a postdoc working on that. He is now trying to check whether we can use the technology to figure out what are the correlations between morphology building and the dark matter halos that were simulated and their uh -huh. structure, how to see how Gauss content and things could relate to each other. So it gives you a playground. And that's what explorative research should be about. You should be free to come up with own ideas, play around. Don't build your own huge machine learning models and train them for weeks test a hypothesis, but, but really scrolling around like on Google Maps or uh -huh. those tools, you, you get into details, you zoom in and oh, it's like here, then you zoom out, you go to a different region, you zoom in. And that's what we think could be a good approach to understand in a rich data set what is in your data set, to identify outliers, and to do those things of research. Wow, I mean, that's you're taking machine lear learning to the different level. I mean, you're complete. I mean, you are really uh, not only identify galaxies, but also to understand about the morphology, uh, the, the what does the different galaxies and group of galaxies can do for or universe that explain dark matter and things like that. So. Yeah, I, I think I presented first stuff in that direction already. Nine years ago in Calgary, I won the best poster prize at ADAS yes. with this pink poster <laughs> on yes. radio galaxies and their morphologies. And we are just taking the concept further and further over the years. And we really want to build very intuitive, usable tools for astronomers to access data sets and use machine learning as something to pre structure everything, to give you just the important task of yeah. asking the question why, the how, the machine should do, the sorting, yeah. all the stuff. But you should say, oh, Horeca, what did I find here? That's awkward. Let's look at this, yeah? Or yeah. you should look at things and say, oh, why is this correlated with that? Why is the distribution of observed galaxies different to the distribution of simulated galaxies? Looking at the projected, those are the questions we want to trigger. This is what humans are good for, machine learning, AI. It's not creative. Yeah, even though we have this discussion with ChatGPT, it's very good in composing things. Yeah, and it's better in language than I'm. That's not a <laughs> big deal. But it's not creative. And I think we are the ones that should do the creative task, and we are the ones that should come up with the why, and we should answer the why, because that's what science and physics is about. Yeah, and, and one important thing it is that you you have the physics, the knowledge in physics and astrophysics to train things, to know what is reality. I can say chat GPT sometimes does not bring the, the right things. So you are training with something that astronomers can use. And one uh, final question, the, in the kind of work that you do and in your institution also, you deal with a lot of data. So uh, now you are going to extend this to the observation, to the visible light, right? So you are expanding your knowledge and machine learning to different fields. Yeah, so in, in principle, what I'm always picky about in my group is that what we do method-wise is so general, we are agnostic and we play with data from observations in radio or optical that makes no difference to us. For example, I'm also involved in a project with cardiologists. I use tools developed for morphologies of radio galaxies now to understand what are the morphologies of cardiomyocytes. 
to help diagnose certain heart diseases. So that's what I'm working on. So the method is just so general it can be applied to everything. And that's the same in astrophysics. For me personally, my personal interest is more on the cosmology side. But of course you can put in data from planetary science as well. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just following my interest in how does the universe evolve those things. That definitely, uh, yeah. What are triggering me, what I'm interested in. But of course, yeah, the tools we provide, and they are, since the very beginning, we put everything open source. It's all on GitHub. You can download all the tools. Yeah. A lot of tools we started with. The one I presented in Calgary is now used at SKA, at LOFA, to do with radio galaxies. That's state of that, the art for them. Right. And, and, and that's really sort of cool, yeah. But you can use it for optical data as well. And I have now someone using this for young stellar objects, for example. So completely different data, completely scientific questions. Yeah, one is in the radio, one is near infrared, one is, might be optical. I don't care <laughs> to a certain degree. Well, it's the used. important thing is it's a methodology that enables researchers to do their job, to ask the question of the why. That's great. So thank you so much. And uh, is there any other uh, thing that you would like to highlight about your career? Uh, well, let me, let me go back to something. Uh, you have uh, several students that now work with you and I think uh, you like uh, you like also um, teach all those things to to young people to the new generations that are going to to mm. come later how many students do you have now I always prefer just to have a smaller team yeah so at the moment I have two PhD students a bachelor and a master student so I think a good supervision means Definitely. A good ratio. And I'm just taking the really best ones. And I'm very picky with selecting wow. the ones. <laughs> yeah, because I want students that are encouraged by themselves. I shouldn't be the person to push on them and say, get things done. I want people that explode because of ideas. And I'm just there calming them down and guiding them a little bit because that's what research is about. Of course, I'm teaching with experience, but on the other hand, I'm guiding with experience. And the guidance process is the necessary step to become an independent critical researcher. Yeah. And it's not creating a second me. That's not what we want. But the, you touched upon a point I consider very important. We see this extremely rapid change in demands of skills. But universities seem to be so slow in catching up and changing their curricula and preparing the next generation yeah. of researchers. At least that's my perception. And I think it's really up to the students also to invest a lot of time in getting those extra skills and being prepared for those data intense challenges to learn about those techniques. Because blindly applying machine learning is so easy. Yeah. But it's so dangerous because if you don't critically question the outcome, you're not doing science, you're just applying A on B and get a result Without C. Without knowing, yeah. And you, you don't know what the implication of it is. You really have to understand how algorithms work, what they do, what they aim for, and use them properly and do proper checking of statistics, whether things are correct or not. Well, that's great that you are giving that knowledge to people working with you. But as you say, and, and as I will always say, people that is studying a PhD, it is not that you become uh, Einstein or a super powerful person. It's you become an independent. Mm -hmm. You are a person capable of taking in pro problems and solve them. So you are preparing people in, in an area um, very interesting. So. So I think that's great. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Oh, you're uh, welcome. I, Many thanks. No, thank you. And uh, hopefully um, you will talk to us about all the interesting things that you are doing in the future. I will. <laughs> Many thanks for having me. Thanks a lot for thank the nice you. conversation. Thanks a lot. Thank you.